Hello, everybody. Um, real pleasure to be here with all of you. A uh, little bit about me real quick. Um, I run a company called Siftio up in San Francisco, and it comes out of my uh, graduate work at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, I'm basically a user interface hacker and designer and a musician also. And my primary fascination is to evolve the ways that we interact with digital content, which we do all the time every day. And I want to make our tools better match to how our brains and bodies work. So I'm going to talk about Siftables, which is my main project and now product. Um, and I'm going to dig into our design process a little bit about how this idea came up in the first place and what we did to, uh, to progress it. So I grew up with toys that encouraged building. You remember toys like this? These were constructivist toys where putting smaller pieces together uh, into a composed whole was the nature of the activity. And it was a long time before I even knew what that term, constructivist, meant. But even as a little kid, this kind of activity felt really compelling, and I could play with toys like this for hours. So this talk is about the design of siftables, not Legos. But I think those toys left a big impression on me and led to the design of what I do now. So at some point, all of us start using computers, right? But if you think about the way we interact with a computer, we've got this mouse cursor going around on a screen, uh, interacting with what could be a very vast digital space. Um, but think about if someone sat you down in front of a pile of Legos like this and said, you can use one fingertip to build something cool. Now, it'd be really difficult, at least at first. And then eventually, because you're all creative people, you'd figure out strategies to cope with this constraint about, well, maybe I can use a fingertip in my elbow or a fingertip in my nose, and I can figure out a way to do it. And that's exactly what we do with the mouse. Um, we have right click and shift click and click and drag and all these ways to cope with the fact that we fundamentally have this one fingertip way of interacting. So along with my collaborator, um, we started to wonder, well, what if when we use the computer, instead of moving a mouse cursor around a desktop like one digital fingertip, what, could, what if we could reach in and grasp information physically using our hands, moving it and arranging it uh, using those skills that were already built in from growing up as a kid playing with Legos and blocks and other physical toys? So that was the original inspiration for Siftables. We wanted to build an interface that felt like playing with blocks or other physical objects, but that could change the way people interact with digital information and media. And so by making this activity more physical, we thought we had a chance to make it more natural. So in a nutshell, Siftables are interactive computers the size of a cookie. Uh, they can be moved around by hand. They can sense each other and when they get placed next to each other. Uh, they can also sense motion, like shaking and tilting and when they get turned upside down. And they have a screen and a wireless radio, and they can run all kinds of different applications. So I think Siftables are part of a new, much richer ecosystem of physical tools that are going to allow us to interact with digital media in new ways. So let me show you a few of our early design sketches. These were uh, prototypes of the kinds of interactions we thought might be interesting to do. So flipping one of these objects over as a way to change content, like turning the pages in a book, or something we know from our physical world lives, mixing up a liquid by shaking it. Why not blur a picture by shaking it more and more? This is showing tilting one way to roll a video in one direction or tilt it the other way to roll another direction. Here's pouring a color the way we might pour a liquid. Or then if you overshoot, pour a little bit back. This is just a playful demo that we showed that we built pretty early on just to show how these little objects could relate to each other. Those are some of my professors from graduate school. And this is just kind of showing how quickly they interact with each other. So there's all these things that uh, I realized we could do with a system like this. And I wanted to say a few words about the design process that led to this system. Um, so my, as I mentioned, I have a collaborator, Jeevan Kalanithi. And he and I were interested in how interactions with digital media could be made more like interactions with physical objects. So we thought there could be some advantages in terms of performance and also in the experience of using a computer uh, if we could bring the digital and the physical together in a new way. And so the basic idea was to give 
individual digital media items like my photo thumbnails or my emails or the icons on my desktop to give these things a physical embodiment so we could use our hands and manipulate them as a group. Uh, and I should say we were at, uh, at the MIT Media Lab working on this, which was a great place for us to be able to, to incubate these ideas and try them out. So for us, that, that, um, that factor of having a space and a place to do this work in was really important. Um, so we made prototypes. We used wood, we used paper, we used acrylic. We experimented with the size they should be, what kind of form factor, what shape, and what kind of content might be embodied well by little interactive tiles like this. Um, we thought about, well, if these are down on the table, the way if you had a pile of Legos in front of you, uh, they have the screens need to be big enough so you can see what's on them. And yet they need to be small enough so you can handle a bunch of them at the same time. So the size of a cell phone was too big. So we had a lot of, uh, before we even started building technology, we had a lot of uh, design that was non-technological. Um, we got most of the key features working at the, at the point that we decided they needed a screen and motion sensing and neighbor sensing. Uh, and then we started to iterate on the hardware and the firmware and the case and make a higher level way of programming these little blocks. And at the point where we had built a way to program them, that was really a turning point because it, for us it made programming these blocks just like programming in a software application. So since we, knew how to, since we had a computer science background, we could start working really fluidly with them. We made a bunch of them. Uh, we, had, we had a batch of 140. Uh, as graduate students, that's a lot of anything to build. Um, and we had a lot of help from some undergrads who helped us assemble all these things, so we made a little mini factory right in our lab. Um, and these same undergrads helped us build the first few applications uh, on the set. And so I'll show a few of these applications later that we built. Uh, we started getting development kits out to a community of other developers. Uh, some internal developers, like my office mate, who wanted to make applications for kids, some external uh, R&D labs from companies that, that saw some potential and were interested, uh, and built a wiki to gather feedback. And then finally, I evaluated a few applications with users to better understand the advantages and limitations uh, of a platform like this uh, for interaction. And so the details of that are in my thesis. I won't bore you with that right now. Um, so a few categories of applications that we've tried with this new physical system for interacting with digital media. And the first category, play. So here's, a, here's an early prototype of a maze exploration game that an undergraduate working with me built over the course of a couple weeks. And the idea is that your character is the little, the little dot, and you get to dump your character from one place to the next by tilting the block. So it borrows this metaphor of dumping an object from one container to another, but applies it to this virtual space, exploring a maze. And then you've got a map mode where you can see where you've been. Uh, here's a word finding game that uh, we made that's something like, uh, like a boggle type game. You're basically looking for trying to make words by putting the letters together. And uh, it shows you when you've got a word by circling the letters and giving you some sound feedback. And then about every 30 seconds or so, it changes. And you've got a new set of letters. And then you'll, off you go again. And so we've, we've had a lot of kids and a lot of adults try these games out. Here's some kids uh, at an event at Google playing with it. Oh, yeah. students at the media lab that came through on a field trip. Oh, you already did Um so another category of applications that we played around with but haven't done, I have to say, we have not done serious work in this direction, but we see a lot of promise is for learning. Um, so I think there are some great possibilities for education here where you want to give people the chance to 
uh, like language, math, and logic games where you want to rearrange uh, the problem quickly and see what the result is. So here's a simple equation maker that just responds to the equation that you put together. So in this case, I'm building the Fibonacci sequence. And then you'll see I'll pick up the plus and tilt it, and it'll turn it into a minus. And I mentioned that my office mate got really interested in the possibilities for applications for kids around different kind of learning scenarios. And so he got inspired by this Dr. Seuss book called Hop on Pop. It has these very simple, very short sentences. And so he made an application that was about putting together three word sentences and having the system show the result of the sentence. So here's a couple of examples. Feet on street. So you get the picture on the fourth street one, on feet. street on feet. Bun and sun, sun and bun. So in addition to these really basic word ordering things, it gives you, uh, it, it puts, uh, it makes, it capitalizes the first letter and puts a period at the end. So even though these are kind of sentence fragments, it starts to give the patterns of what a, a real sentence looks like. So there were a few applications that I roughly categorized into the creativity category. Um, this is like a physical Photoshop application that I built uh, as part of my thesis, which was basically let you start with an image that was represented both on a block and then the same one big on your computer screen. And then you could apply image processing filters to it by putting those blocks next to it. So say a blur or a uh, thresholding or a hue adjustment, and then you could tilt the blocks to adjust the intensity of each of those effects. So here you can see uh, me adjusting the intensity of a threshold effect. And then once I got it to the intensity I wanted, I could put it back into the sequence. So this is probably my, my favorite application. This is a music sequencer uh, that I built. Um, and the idea of how this works was that you had um, different voices or different kind of lead sounds, like, uh, or you had, you had lead, you had bass, and you had drums. Uh, and then you had these blank sequence tiles that were meant to be filled with sound and then arranged in the order that you wanted. And then there were some effects, like reverb and filter, that you could apply to a particular voice and then adjust it by tilting in real time. And global effects like tempo and, uh, and volume that you could apply to the whole piece. So here's an example of how it worked. So I've inserted this lead line into these two blocks, made a sequence of two. Now I extend the sequence to three and put, some, put a bass line into the rightmost two blocks. You can see where we are by the highlighted border. Now I put some drums into each one, but a different version of the drums in each one because you can see the different number of dots there. Here's a filter kind of like a wah pedal for a guitar player. I can speed the whole thing up with the tempo. And then I'll apply the filter to the bass line. And you can rearrange the sequence as you go, given that these are blocks. That's one of the key, uh, key benefits there. And then I can studio fade the whole thing out by tilting the volume block. Thank you. <laughs> One more application. Uh, this is a, an interactive narrative application. It's kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure cartoon uh, designed to teach some, some basic language skills to children, also by my friend and office mate, Seth Hunter. And uh, how it works is by picking moon is a block up off the table, for instance, showing the moon, yeah. he's looking at a bigger screen in front of him, and it make, turns it into night. The sun is rising. And then he picks up a block showing the sun, and it turns it into day. Now he finds the tractor. The orange tractor. And the tractor comes into the scene. Yeah. And then he brings other characters Hello, in cat. by shaking the blocks so he can make the dog and cat meet each other Hello, by putting those Hello. blocks next to each other. 
give the hot air balloon to the cat. So he's going to put the hot air balloon next to the cat. Fly away, cat. So this is really just an open-ended story. Uh, it allows him to decide what happens. So I think there are a lot of possibilities for education. Um, we've been getting contacted by a lot of teachers and a lot of parents that see this potential. And um, we're getting pretty close to being able to have uh, this product to provide kits uh, so people can start building applications. And I really look forward to enabling people to explore these directions. So in 30 seconds, what are we doing now? Um, we have started an internal studio to build high quality applications uh, in the play area, kind of, kind of like our game studio. Um, we have a simulator for our own internal software development, which is kind of ironic to have an on-screen version of blocks that are made to be physical, but helps us write software. And then finally, we have real blocks that are coming online. So these are early prototypes that you see. The new ones look even cooler. In this example, both the virtual blocks and the physical blocks are running the same program, where they basically show that they have noticed when they get next to each other by drawing a line. So pretty early stuff, but um, I want to close with a really insightful quote by Paul Durish, who's a researcher in human-computer interaction. He said, tangible computing is of interest, and this project is an example of tangible computing. It's of interest precisely because it is not purely physical. It's a physical realization of a symbolic reality. And I think this applies perfectly to what we're doing with Siftables. They're not fully digital, not fully physical, just like our interactions with information that we have every day already. And they allow us to physically manipulate information concepts. And that's why I think they're so powerful. So thanks for your attention. And here's how you can reach me. And I look forward to hearing your ideas.